Hello, everybody. It is Saturday, about 3 p.m. in New Orleans, and um, I'm going to start with our lectures. That's a good time for me to come up. The baby is now asleep. Um, where's the baby? That's Catherine. Uh, she is blissfully unaware of all of this. She is the perfect age, I have to say. There's her and her friend Oyster really wanting to go outside and play. It's heartbreaking. Anyway, uh, as I said, today will be a recap of the last lecture that we had in person a few Fridays ago about abolitionism. It's a little condensed, not much, honestly. Uh, I'm going to give up the PowerPoints. But again, this is a learning curve for all of us, okay? You should be able to see this. Full screen. And there we go. I'm just going to adjust a couple things here for me. And we've been talking about the diverging paths of the North and the South throughout the 17th and really, I'm um, sorry, the 18th and really the 19th century. Uh, this transition, this sectional separation, uh, is personified by this man, which you are probably not familiar with, named Elijah Lovejoy. He was born in 1802 in Albion, Maine. Like many Americans of his generation, he felt that push to move out to the West, and so he did, moving to St. Louis, Missouri, uh, where he began a weekly newspaper. He was a religious man. He was vehemently opposed to slavery, and he began publishing editorials about the evils of slavery. Um, his printing press well, one evening was destroyed by vandals. Uh, he was receiving constant threats. Uh, I believe his second press was destroyed as well. Uh, and so finally, to keep himself safe, he moved across the river to the free state of Illinois. Uh, well thought he was going to be safe. Um, he continued printing his editorials, denouncing slavery. Uh, the death threats kept coming in. Another press was destroyed. And then finally, the scene to the right, or my right, I don't know if it's flipped on the screen, but uh, it depicts his office uh, where a crowd, a mob gathered outside, yelling for him. Uh, he, when he finally did emerge, he was shot uh, five times and he did die from his injuries. Uh, he was murdered essentially for denouncing slavery. Um, Elijah Lovejoy was considered an abolitionist. Moreover, he is considered a martyr of the abolition movement. Uh, the abolition in itself means to remove, to get, sorry, get rid of something. Um, but in the context of American history, uh, this time, it means anti-slavery. And abolitionists uh, became more and more radical as the century moved on. And prior to the Civil War, people like Lovejoy uh, were rare. They were not common. Um, a minority of the people in the North ever really supported uh, the movement for immediate abolition. They perhaps saw, like, gradual... You know, many adhere by the belief that black and white people could never live side by side. Um, and for one thing, abolitionists did, though, over time, they forced Northerners to uh, think about slavery, to perhaps question its uh, compatibility with their own values, their own ideas, uh, economic ideas, social ideas, political ideas, uh, free labor, which we've spoken about recently. And well, abolitionism really takes off with William Lloyd Garrison, who some of you may have heard of. Uh, he began publishing a newspaper, The Liberator, uh, in 1831. Um, he was born poor in Massachusetts, uh, worked to the newspaper business uh, before he, for a year, for his whole life, really, until he's really turned to reform. He advocated not just uh, abolitionism, but uh, pacifism, women's rights and other reforms. Um, he was not a moderate or 
a conservative person. He was a very fiery speaker, a very fiery writer. Uh, he, rather theatrical perhaps, uh, famous for burning copies of the Constitution at rallies, uh, which he called a uh, covenant with death and an agreement with hell, because he believed that the Constitution, he rightly believed that the Constitution sanctioned slavery. Uh, also, he refused to vote. He founded the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1831. Um, uh, he was committed not to the ideas of colonization or gradual emancipation, but immediate. Um, slavery was considered by many abolitionists a sin, That's especially Garrison, and you do not compromise with sin. Uh, this was part of the evangelical influence of this Second Great Awakening that we're going to speak of a little bit more later. Uh, emphasis of sinfulness and ridding oneself of sinfulness. Uh, and over time, radical abolitionists uh, came to have powerful influence over northern public opinion. Uh, for one thing, they tended to be drawn from upper, middle and upper classes of people, people who had wealth, people who had some influence, uh, access to newspapers, uh, they were literate, Lit they were a literate people, they were literate, they could read and write, uh, very vocal. Um, another thing that was going on in America, uh, this, the same time as, uh, as this abolitionist movement is that the United States uh, acquired Texas, New Mexico, and California, and all the lands between the Rockies uh, and the coast. Uh, all told, the U.S. gained uh, 1.5 million square miles. Uh, a prominent newspaper in New York City uh, explained the seismic shift and the fate of the Republic. It was a country's manifest destiny to so overspread the continent from one coast to the next. Uh, and this cry to move west was taken up by many Americans. Uh, so despite the differences between north and south, slave labor, free labor, just about everyone is going west, right? Uh, if we had to generalize about the North in the decades leading up to the Civil War, we would say that it was society, was a society becoming fiercely dedicated to free labor. Well, and they defined their society against the Northern slave system. Uh, Northerners uh, looked for opportunities for social, social mobilization, land ownership, uh, justly rewarded work uh, with pride, things of that nature. And they looked upon free nature as the natural outgrowth uh, of the founder's vision for America. Uh, the trouble was on the other side, the slave South uh, likewise felt that they were the true custodians of the founder's vision, right? And they uh, were fiercely dedicated to states' rights, whether we'll see later that they, that more not really. Um, anyway, uh, local control, I guess we'll say, individual freedom to own enslaved people, um, and the freedom, basically that means the freedom to deny freedom to other people uh, who maintain human property. Uh, and these two visions would clash in the political battles that we're about to speak about in the 1840s and 50s, uh, leading all the way up to the Civil War. Uh, and how we get there is the subject of discussion of the next several classes. Classes isn't the right word, is it? Video lectures, we'll call it. Um, political questions surrounding slavery became the center of heated, uh, contested debates over the, for, over the 1840s and 50s. Uh, but why? Uh, a lot of it had to do with the West. Uh, it's wide open territory. Uh, forcing opponents and proponents of slavery to dig in their respective heels. And from the North uh, comes increasingly powerful and strident abolitionist movement, and from the South, uh, increasingly powerful defense of slavery, one that would be shared, this defense shared by many Southerners, not just slave owning, but also by poor white non-slave owning Southerners. Uh, and from the West now is this new part of the country, right? It's this complicated question. Uh, the future of slavery as both Northerners and Southerners are moving west in the newly acquired lands uh, after the Mexican War. Um, and so this combination of expansion, uh, fierce feelings for or against slavery, uh, clashing ideas of the very nature and purpose of American republicanism 
but ultimately this leads to the crack up of the union and the greatest cataclysm in American history. So more than a million miles of new territory came under the control of the United States during the 1840s. Uh, the greatest wave of expansion, this is the biggest wave of expansion in the country since the Louisiana Purchase, obviously. And by the end of the 1840s, uh, the United States possessed all territories of the present day United States, uh, except of course for Hawaii and Alaska. Uh, many factors account for this great expansion. Uh, perhaps most important to, uh, was this idea of manifest destiny. It reflected the nationalism, this strident nationalism that Americans felt in the mid 19th century, uh, as well as the idealistic uh, quests for social reform uh, that uh, fired many other reform movements uh, throughout that uh, century. And by the 1840s, though, Manifest Destiny had spread throughout the nation, uh, partially due to uh, the press. Uh, it was a diverse, di divisive issue. Uh, not everyone uh, embraced the ideas. The uh, question of slavery and the lands acquired in the Louisiana Purchase had been the source of a very large controversy in 1819 and 1820, which resulted in the, and this was important, the Missouri Compromise, uh, which established the principle that there shouldn't be any slavery north of the 3630 line, uh, as well as the idea that slave and free states should roughly balance, cancel one another out. And so there it is right there. You can see the newly admitted state of uh, Missouri uh, and Maine balances out. Uh, what makes matters worse though, uh, is the fact that Americans become increasingly, are becoming increasingly agitated over the issue of slavery. The abolitionist movement, which had kicked into full gear in the 1830s, uh, was gaining adherence uh, and pushing Southerners to defend slavery even more ardently than uh, they had in the past. Uh, other major problems uh, was the fact that the United States did not necessarily have a legal claim uh, to for the lands beyond the Louisiana Purchase. Uh, you can see here Texas and Oregon uh, are part of the Spanish and the British empires. Um, they also bring into question uh, the ideas of the expansion of slavery into these new territories, right? So we get to the presidential election of 1844, which pits Henry Clay from Kentucky against this younger upstart from Tennessee, uh, James Polk. Uh, and Polk is seen kind of like a Andrew Jackson kind of guy. He was even called young Hickory. Andrew Jackson was old Hickory, so he is young Hickory. Um, expansion, was at the center of this election of 1844. Um, both candidates uh, definitely believed in the importance of the West and Western movement, uh, yet Clay was a little bit more conservative in his approach. He believed that the U.S. Uh, could acquire this land through treaties, through purchases, uh, and not Polk's approach to this. He, he wasn't, he just was an adherent of Manifest Destiny. Uh, so he thought the West was the United States' birthright, the expansion to the Pacific, right? It can be claimed uh, through violence if necessary. Uh, it's nothing to be negotiated here. It will happen. And his, his, he was pretty much saying, if you elect me, we are going to get all of this land. Um, Polk won the election uh, slightly, very slight margin. Apparently, approximately 36,000 votes, not many at all. Now, uh, when Texas had become our independent republic, uh, independent from Mexico, no one uh, bothered or no one exactly knew what the boundaries were exactly, okay? Here, uh, President Polk made an offer to Mexico to buy the land uh, west of Texas, which is New Mexico, Arizona, California. Uh, Mexicans rejected that offer and so Polk ordered American troops uh, in that region uh, between the uh, Nueces, Nueces River and the Rio Grande. Uh, 
and he ordered troops to just kind of patrol through there. He's agitating the Mexican army. Um, and there's his declaration, which you can read there. Uh, he supported the claim that the Texas border was the Rio Grande, not the Nunes River. Uh, even though the Nunes had been the Texas border, um, and there were no Texans living there. Show that again. We'll see where the rivers are. Uh, Mexicans obviously resented American aggression, uh, and after months of these American patrols, soldiers attacked the Americans, uh, killing eleven. Uh, but this now gives Polk uh, the opportunity to for his war that he was wanting pretty much all alone along, and in. On May 13th of 1846, uh, the United States declared war with unanimous, just about unanimous support from Congress. Um, to not support this war was seen as treason, as anti-American. One very young congressman did oppose um, war with Mexico, and it pretty much ended his political career for 15 or so years until he was later elected president. Uh, that man, of course, is Abraham Lincoln. Um, war fever is on in the country, right? Uh, Herman Melville, uh, as he was writing Moby Dick, said that uh, the people are in a state of delirium. Uh, military, military ardor pervades all ranks. Nothing is talked about uh, but the halls of Montezuma, Mexico City, right? Uh, this is going to be a war of destiny, right? This is destiny. This is uh, an Illinois newspaper justified the war on the basis that Mexicans were, quote, uh, reptiles in the path of progressive democracy. Uh, so it's kind of racist here. And when I say kind of, I mean blatantly racist. Uh, this land is not only destiny, it is the destiny of the white man. Uh, American forces were able to defeat Mexican forces. Um, it wasn't quite as quickly as Polk was thinking it would happen, um, but still American military dominance allowed the United States to gain remaining Mexican portions of the American West uh, under very favorable terms. This, here we go. Uh, Mexico agreed to secede California and New Mexico. Uh, and to acknowledge the Rio Grande as the border of Texas. Uh, and in return, the uh, United States promised to pay uh, the government, uh, Mexican government, uh, $15 million, approximately the price of the Louisiana Purchase. Let's use that. Let me turn that off. I'm not even going to look. I don't want to know. And uh, let's see. Ah. But this, of course, brings up the question of slavery. Uh, Emerson summed it up in his journal in 1840, saying, the United States will conquer Mexico, but, we, but it will be as a man who swallows arsenic, which brings him down in turn. Mexico will poison us. And he was right. Because, again, this acquisition of Mexico brings up the question of slavery. Uh, New Hampshire Senator Daniel Webster, all these people have streets named after them right by Tulane's campus. Anyway, his quote, uh, he basically was just laughing it off. Uh, claim is a big fuss, a fuss over nothing. Why this, the imaginary Negro in this impossible place? Like how in the world could there ever be enslaved people out there? It's really far away, right? That's crazy. It's not an area that is hospitable to plantations and to planting things very much. You know, that's not true actually, uh, but he was wrong to laugh this off. So the northern implications here. Uh, why not? Why couldn't slavery go this far? You know, there's now gold. Why can't enslaved people be used to mine for gold or to build railroads or build anything else out there, right? Uh, this is opposed to their ideals of free labor. Also, many northerners, northerners thought that the way to end, end slavery is to restrict it to just kind of keep it small, uh, not let it spread anymore, keep it where it is, uh, and let it hopefully just die out because it, the South and enslavers already had too much power in their mind, right? 
Also, uh, getting to that, more slave states, more power uh, for these slave states, for these slave owners, less power for northern non-slave owning, non-slave owning states. Uh, the West was opposed, uh, the West though is supposed to be free labor uh, for white people. And a lot of northerners, the West was uh, a place where they could hold out hope for immigrants, factory workers and uh, other possibilities such as small farms, land ownership, individual liberty for mechanics, uh, small farmers, etc. Now, the southern implications. Calhoun, another street. Uh, slavery has to expand like a shark. It has to keep moving or it's going to die. And the failure to expand would mean a loss of political power, uh, a loss of ability to defend this institute of slavery. Uh, property and honor two things that southerners are really into right slaves were property and they felt they would be deprived of their liberty to use their property if they couldn't move their property where they wanted to move it right calhoun from south carolina uh said you have no right you northerners have no right to stop me from taking my wagon and my horse and my slave anywhere i wish uh, also, honor, an important part of Southern life. Uh, Southerners are not going to be told what to do, especially by a Yankee. That's beyond the pale. Wilmot Provincia. Uh, early in the Mexican War, this pretty unknown Democrat from Pennsylvania, uh, Daniel Wilmot, got up in Congress with, he put forward this amendment, uh, which came to be known as Wilmot Provincia. Uh, it suggests that slavery be prohibited in any territory acquired from Mexico during the war. Uh, all but one northern state legislator endorsed it. Uh, every single southern legislature, shocker, opposed it. Uh, passed the House of Representatives on the first try, 83 to 64, uh, reflecting that the House had far more northern representatives because the North had a much greater population, even with the three-fifth clause. Uh, but it did not pass the Senate, where slave states still had parity. It's just, you know, how two senators from here, two senators from there. Uh, the Provisio sparked an important movement, uh, the Free Soil Movement. This was important, the Free Soil Movement. Uh, free soldiers, uh, free soilers, sorry, uh, were not abolitionists. They were not seeking racial justice at all, not even close. They were intensely, very, very dedicated to the idea that the West had to be free soil or free labor for white people, right? Congress had the power to them to determine uh, whether or not any new territories would be free or slave. Congress could do this, they had the power. So in other words, Congress could ban slavery in places where it did not already exist. So there's no slaves in California, Congress has a right to say there never can be slaves in California. Uh, Congress had to do this, though, in their minds, to help free white laborers. Um, this would be an important set of ideas uh, that sticks around until the Civil War. Uh, it's the beginning of what would be a long, difficult fight. Uh, Pro-slavery Southerners were vehemently opposed to any idea that would limit the spread of slavery. Uh, and according to their argument, uh, the territories belong to the entire nation. Hence, all Americans had equal rights to them, or in them, I'm sorry, uh, including the right to bring their property, including slave people, into these new territories. So in their mind, Congress had no right to ban slavery from any new territory, or really anywhere in the nation. Um, so what would they do? These Southerners, of course, want to take the enslaved people with them anywhere they wanted to. Uh, there were a number of different plans, some different ideas. Some wanted to extend the Missouri Compromise uh, all the way over to the coast. Others favored the idea of uh, popular sovereignty, uh, which means just let's vote on it in that territory. You know, when you get people out there, let them decide for themselves whether this would be a slave territory or not. Uh, debate uh, over these proposals raged on for several years. Uh, but it's not until 1850, as we can see here, that I got worked out. Uh, Anti-slavery forces in the East were trying to abolish slavery in Washington, D.C. Uh, personal liberty laws in the North were barring courts and police from returning 
uh, runaway slaves to their masters. Uh, meanwhile, fugitive slave laws, sorry, those are called. And meanwhile, the new territory of California is growing so, so rapidly uh, as a result of the gold rush uh, that was ready to apply for statehood in 1849. Really, just get that paperwork done. Uh, and whilst uh, white Southerners feared that admission of California would give free states too much power, uh, the number of free states and slave states was equal in 1849, but the admission of California would uh, offset this balance. So the compromise of 1850 comes along, um, Congress is deadlocked over the issue. So Henry Clay, the great compromiser, he was, began this process working towards uh, how to make people happy with you know, the issues of slavery in the new territories. Uh, his compromise had a few key parts. Uh, California should be admitted to the Union as a free state. Okay, second, so that all of the lands acquired from the Mexican War in those territories, there'll be no restrictions on slavery. Uh, the people there would decide for themselves. They would vote. Third, uh, the slave trade, but not slavery itself, should be banned from D.C. Uh, and fourth, that a new, more effective, effective fugitive slave law will be put in place. And we'll cover that later on. Uh, it's compromise resolution only locked Congress up tighter. It was, of course, very hard to uh, pass these. Visions. It took seven months of debate. Uh, members of Congress, though, when this is all over, they're all claiming victory, patting themselves on the back. Um, the president was uh, Fillmore, Millard Fillmore. At that time, he signed the bill, called it a just statement, saying, in its character, noble, noble and irrevocable. Uh, but they thought they had beaten the issue back, you know, if they thought they had just beaten this issue back with slavery. Uh, that would go away. They're, of course, terribly, terribly mistaken. For a few years after the Compromise of 1850, things did mellow out. Sectional conflict kind of calmed down. People are moving out west. People are making money. Um, but the tensions between north and south were only just temporary, temporarily calm. Um, they would obviously return. So that is the edited version of this lecture. I'm going to just lecture it, num put a number at lecture one. Uh, we'll go on from there. So thank you all, and I'll have a new one up Monday.